right, testing five, four. One of these days I'll figure out how to do the thing where I just capture one window, but for now you guys will see type out a tweet. Hashtag game dev. Always a good one to add. Watch myself on stream. Good. Close this. I it always says like on 12 or whatever. I don't think there are 12. I don't think I have 12 people viewing me right now. That would be really weird. But if I am, let me uh, make yourselves known. You just weekly art stream. Stream creative. Done. Okay, apparently there are 14 people. No, that's not a fake number. I don't, I can't say why. But. I'm also looking at the dropped frames on my own thing. It doesn't really seem that bad. So, whatever. Oh, well, if there are actually 14 or 12 or 10 of you, it doesn't really matter. Because I will speak to just you, the listener. My name is Breeze, and I'm an artist. I was born in a tiny town called Oxford. And... Then I went to high school and I made a robot game. No, that's not right. I went to high school and then I went to high school and then I went to college and I made a robot game. Very different. Now I'm out of college for a few years and I've been making this same robot game for a decent amount of time. Not the exact same robot game, but it's been the main project that I've been on for a while. It's mostly because when you start something new, you don't really know what you're doing. So you make a lot of mistakes over and over again. Mistakes that you don't even know are mistakes until way after you make them. And that's just the nature of trying new things. Failing and failing and failing again. And succeeding again and succeeding again and succeeding again. But then the hardest part is knowing what to make of it. So what I'm actually doing today is there are some robots in the game that I'm going to retouch the art for. Uh, one of them is this guy who actually has some pretty cool art already, this robot. This guy looks like a beetle. And it goes directly to, is piloted by this man, Rios, who has giant purple punch gauntlets. Um, and he kind of shoots lightning out of his hands and stuff, and so does his robot. But these two arts were done by two different artists uh, at two different times. So the robot was designed before the character, and the character was designed like 
right around the same time as the robot. So neither of the neither neither of the artists doing either of these knew what the other thing looked like really. So now that these assets are most are finished and we have them, I'd like to increase the uh, the parity between the character and his robot. So I'll probably be adding like some green glows to these holes to match this guy. Um, I'll probably be redoing this face a little bit just because I don't like the face. Uh, that's about it. And then uh, over here in the Photoshop document I call the toy box. It's where we keep all of the robot art. There are some other robots that could definitely use some new art because they were drawn many years ago. Um, in case anyone's wondering if my art skills have increased in the last few years, I don't really bill myself as an artist much anymore, I'm more of a designer. But I'll show you one of the arts that we did on one of these streams a few weeks ago was the art for ISO 100, which is a commander robot, kind of like the one I'm doing now. It's another purple robot. It's piloted by one of the hero characters in the game uh, named Ixa. And that's this guy right here. This one... This one is uh, was drawn in around 2013, and this one was drawn at the end of 2016. So, I guess there's about a four years difference there. This one was drawn in a Wacom Intuos, a uh, big black tablet thing. Uh, this one's done drawn on my uh, Elite Book 2760. Uh, which is a laptop where you can draw on the screen. It has Wacom drivers built into it. Highly suggested for anybody who wants to do art. Um, so yeah, if you like zoom in here, I didn't even really know how to color in the lines back then, or what layer masks were, or really uh, anything about doing art digitally. And now uh, over here, we have this guy, who is the redrawn version, and as you can see, my lines are cleaner, I have a better idea of how to do shadows, and, you know, glass and metal and sheen and stuff. I did not do the swirly stuff, though, that's actually done by our uh, other in-house illustrator at Zephyr Workshop, who's much better at drawing inorganic things than I am, uh, Emily Hancock. So she added the, uh, the, the glitz to it. Because this robot in-game releases a cloud of spores that drops the evasion of opponents, and I was trying to draw it myself, but as long as we have a person who's good specifically at that kind of thing, um, I asked her to do it. So yeah, clouds and swirls. Very, very Emily. Robots. Uh, very breezy. And then we go over here, and I'm going to show you one of the guys that I'm going to do uh, redo the art for this, this man. Go 100. This green one on the right, I can just get rid of everyone else. Yeah. This guy right here was one of the first robot arts ever drawn for this game. It's basically, this probably took me an hour to do back then, but nowadays this would take me about like, 10 minutes. Um, didn't know how to color in the lines, didn't really know how to do line art, didn't really know how to do anything. Um, I probably like manually, painterly colored this highlight or something. God. So, that's a robot that I want to redraw this week. Uh, along with... Who else? This guy? Yeah, this guy. Do actually the one right on top there on the screen make everyone else disappear this guy the under 100 was also drawn at the same time as that other one i was just showing you back in like 2013 back when i didn't really know how to do art i'm going to be honest i'm not really sure if i know how to do art now but i can't really draw you a pretty sunset but i can draw you some 
these clean lines, I guess. And that is what we'll be doing this week. These two Kirschmuggins. And let me erase this awful shadow. This shadow is actually cut off because when we originally printed the Aegis cards, the card template was arranged in such a way that the illustration was on top of everything. So in order to make it so the shadow didn't exceed the border of the card template, I just erased them. So there's like these nice flat shapes and they look terrible. I mean this like flat cut off on the shadow looks terrible. Um, and that was, that was fascinating. Fascinating process. That was back when we made all of the that's back when we made all of the cards in Photoshop manually. And times have changed. And so now we make our cards in InDesign. So they can uh have as big be as big or as small as the picture wants. As opposed to like this, these glorified MS Paint cards. Back in 2013, 2014. Like I said, you learn a lot of things when you do something for a very long time. But at least uh, we've probably been working on Aegis for about as long as Kamiya was working on Scalebound. That sucks. But hey, what are you going to do? Aegis isn't cancelled, as far as I understand. So hopefully. Um, so hopefully, uh, the cancellation of scale down doesn't affect Kamiya too much. He seems like a very tenacious guy, and hopefully it doesn't affect Platinum Games too much. They're probably the last studio in the business who knows what they're doing. And they've just had to become a contract studio, and it's definitely screwed with them a lot. But making original things is hard. It's much easier to make Power Rangers, a really terrible looking Power Rangers movie, than it is to create your own version of Power Rangers. Like what I try to do. Very sad. No one can appreciate something scale bound apparently. What am I trying to clean this up for? You're going to have to bear with me. I'm not, I'm a little under the weather. Uh, so I'm going to have to manually remember how to draw. And it's something, it's something I always have to do every week, it seems, to do these things. Let's get real. I have an idea. Do put this right here. This is actually, I'm working right out of the uh, the asset file for this robot, which means the, which means the, uh, the asset needs to return back to the original size when I'm done redrawing the robot. So I draw a little margin to remind me where that is so I can crop it easier later. This, I'll do this to fill the background. I'll go back up here. As you can see, I've made two copies of this. This is the current robot, and a copy of it, and I will use this one. I'll just edit and paint over this one. Um, so, just in case I screw it up really royally, I will have the original. I believe somebody called this non-destructive editing in one of those art YouTube videos I probably watched. real question is, how do I make, how do I uh, even get this green fluff in here? I guess I'll find out. I wish I could read the chat. I'm not sure if there is anyone, if uh, you're saying anything in the chat, but if you are, know that I love you. And usually I have a second computer next to me with the chat open. But today I do not. Aha! As I said, I'm relearning how to draw, which means I can't erase something if it's all on the same. So I have made a second layer on top of the one I'm doing. And that will make more sense because all I'm adding is details right now. 
and I'm just adding things to the top of it. So I'll draw that. And I will paste it so it looks like it's coming out of the hole. Then I'll grab white. And I'll just do this. Yeah, maybe I'll do stuff like that. Yeah, I can also, oops, take this, do that, take this, do that, and then maybe I'll make it look like a bulb or something, kind of like big man's over here. I thought up an ethics question earlier today. If I commission these arts, and I'm the art director, am I allowed to change them? Even though after I change them, these arts will appear different from what how they appear in the artist's portfolio. I'm not really sure, actually, if that's right or not. I kind of figured it was, since, you know, it's my game and I'm the client delivered art to me. But I guess if I were an artist, I'd be a little annoyed if the client changed my art after I submitted it. That's a solid question. I don't actually know. I guess I could just ask the artist if he cares. He probably doesn't. <laughs> but at the same time, I guess I was a little tainted. Or not tainted, but I was influenced by the idea of I used to work at a mobile game studio and we got tons of art in from our art outsourcers. And then the art director would paint over it all and give feedback. And he would be the he would have the final say on what it looks like. He would and he would like implement it all. And so I kinda just figured that I have a similar role here where I have a very um very specific vision for what I want things to look like in this game. So I figured, you know, I don't when I when I commissioned these arts, I was originally working there, so I was working fifty hours a week, didn't have time to do anything, so that's why I commissioned the art to begin with. Um, and also, I'm just like slow at doing art. So in my mind, I was just like, okay, I'll commission these guys because I don't have time to do the art, and then I'll get it, I'll get them like ninety five percent there, ninety percent there, or whatever, so I don't you know, irritate them, going back and forth with the most minor detail edits. And then they're gonna, at some point, they would just start charging me for more time. If I'm like, no, 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 add more green floofs to these exact places. No, 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 not like that. This other very specific way. And... I guess that's what got me here. I guess, you know, I, like, asked the question about whether it was okay or not. Predictably, I've acted like on a Facebook group, and predictably, I guess unpredictably, because I didn't really expect it, but several digital artists replied, and they were just like, I would be very upset, or I have been very upset, when clients have altered my work after I passed it in. I'm like, hmm. You know, that is very understandable. Let's see if I can... Can I view the chat at all? Where is the chat? I don't know where the chat is. Oh. Whispers. No, that's like my private message. Ah! ah! I see you. I see you, Bry Fox. I see you, the 3 2. I'm sorry, I haven't, um. Technical problems. Very much technical problems today. Uh, so, yeah, hey, good evening, guys, around the butt hilt thing, see here, your friend, the six foot Ewok, has started watching, oh, hello, six foot Ewok, Sarah is also here, but she's around the corner doing manufacturing things, so, 
You get to look at me editing the stuff. But yeah, I should probably tell... We have one artist who does all the artwork for... Some of the some of the finishing artwork, not all the artwork, but just like he did the box art, and he's done the robots. Uh, this specific robot right here, where I did most of the other ones. Um, and I don't think he, I don't think he knows that I edit the pictures after he passes them in. But I guess I never thought twice about it until a few days ago. And I wonder if that makes me terrible or something. Um, but to answer that earlier question, we've been on Aegis since the start of. 2013 and so it's actually been just about four years and it's not like we've been building the same game all throughout it's more like we started and none of us had any idea how to do anything we didn't know how to build anything or really do anything i knew how to draw a little bit and but i'd never really designed a full game before um and so through 2013 we just kind of like felt it out and we didn't really yeah know what we were doing and then in 2014 we launched the game like our own like self-published version of the game and we thought that was pretty cool so that was the first time we finished Aegis and the second time we finished Aegis is when you signed on with Greenbrier uh, and we had a showable demo version at Gen Con 2015, which was the first time we had traveled across the country to show Aegis. That was wicked cool. Um, so then we had that was the first time that Aegis had like real assets with punch boards and professionally made everything. And then um, not really sure what happened there. Well, I mean I'm completely sure, but it wasn't like the assets weren't final enough. There were boxes like. I don't know, I don't really... Looking back on it with the knowledge I do now, I'm not really sure what happened there. We signed on with a publisher, and then they made a bunch of prototypes, but the game obviously wasn't ready to go to just hit Kickstarter and hit print um, with how it was then. So I don't really know why uh, we even bothered with that. So the idea was it, The idea was to do the Kickstarter for the actual super big awesome print run with professional assets the publisher um, at the end of 2015 but it just kind of fell through um, when we realized that you know nothing was really ready uh, the cards I didn't think the card uh, if we kickstarted the game as it was at the end of 2015 I don't think we would have really done very well at all uh, none of the assets looked very nice publisher kind of asked us to find better assets. I mean, find better board art, find better everything. Um, but we don't really know how to do that, but it kind of fell on us anyway. So I found a graphic designer to do the cards, or redo the cards, rather, redo the logo. Um, so, like, post-Gen Con 2015 was, like, the big switcher-upper. It's no longer, like, okay, we kind of had to make this transition from being super indie and not knowing what we're doing to all of a sudden we were i was learning a lot of things like uh how to communicate with contractors how to direct my ideas and have someone who is more talented than me uh tackle them and that's that was that's not something they really teach you in school um i can barely articulate my own ideas most of the time but I had to uh, pay someone a bunch of money to take an idea that I had and then do it professionally, and then um and that took a while. That was a good. That was a big learning process. Uh, we went through a lot of different iterations of the card because um I'm just kind of bad at communication. Uh, when it can't like I was at least still kind of am. So it was like, they would send me a follow-up, and then I would kind of stare at it, and I just wouldn't know what to say about it. So I would just let it sit for a really long time until I got back to the contractor, and that's why some time got wasted in fall of 2015. But it was, it was complicated, I didn't really know. And then when we started commissioning more art, uh, that was also kind of a pattern. It was, most, it was a little bit on me, yeah. It was so it's like when you started uh, commissioning the background art that you see on the background of the robots and the cards uh we have six different 
landscapes that show the setting of the game. And they're made to be very, very panoramic. And so you can cut them up into different pieces, so they can we have a, a very vast multitude of different backgrounds. But I had never drawn a landscape before, um, or any one of any decent fidelity. Um, I had certainly never asked anybody how to draw. I never. I had never directed anybody on how to draw a landscape. Um, and then I also hired an artist where, where uh, 2D landscapes, he had one in his portfolio that I really liked, so I asked him to do it. But it was also very apparently out of his comfort zone. So it was just uh, someone who doesn't know how to direct, directing someone who didn't really quite know the subject matter of what I was asking for. And that was a very long, arduous process. It took like quite a few months to get those uh, background pieces done. And it was a little silly. It was a little silly how long that took. Um, and it was definitely, a lot of it was definitely my fault. But now I, um, but then after that, things got a lot better. I was, I commissioned uh, some dudes to do more robot art. I was now doing a pretty solid back and forth directive with our graphic designer. Um, I hired somebody pretty much on the spot to do to do uh the commander art these guys this was actually a very smooth process it still took about a month but it, it took about a month for eight full character pieces two of which were completely from scratch uh of just back and forth so these are the skills that you kind of uh, that i kind of learned over time where i didn't i definitely didn't know what i was doing at the first at first i didn't know how to direct anybody um, especially, like, remotely, at least. So, now I'm much, much more comfortable with hiring people, uh, contractors, rather, directing them on what to do, giving them tasks, and getting them feedback in a timely manner. And, of course, a lot of this is just because Aegis's scope as a game is kind of large. It is definitely, um... It's very large. I wanted every character to be unique and stuff. And when I was starting out, um, I thought I had a very tight design, and Aegis's design is very tight, with uh, kind of how every card reads the same. But it could have been tighter in terms of uh, allowing the cards to do more with less, I think. Um, so just like the, the sheer scope of the game and having so many different playable characters and cards and kind of the, the multiplicative balancing and stuff around that, that was... What was I talking about? That's uh, That's been a source of time sink for us. Um, so we did a lot of 2015, 2015 or early 2016 was a lot of like gameplay testing and gameplay revising and adding new features and adding new game codes like uh, point control from a few weeks ago. That was a new feature added in uh, during our time with Greenbrier because um, like that was it was just something that I kind of wanted to add and I thought it'd be a really good idea. I wanted the game to be more board gamey or have a mode that was more. Uh, I wanted to figure out a game mode that did more with our assets than just having our standard, like, 1v1 smashy robots doing smashy robot stuff. That's how that came about. But that was also, uh, I'd never really played board games before. Um, so that took a long time to develop. And I realized, uh, yeah, I, that was, I just realized that was uh, a little hard to do. Without having now, I've played. I'm, I'm starting to increase my board game library exponentially. Um, years into this, and I'm starting to learn about all sorts of things, all sorts of uh, game mechanics, and things that uh, will prevent me from reinventing the wheel in the future. So that's great, and that has helped me design other games besides you. Just I'm drawing on the wrong layer. I've added green, I've added green glowy things. Let's check chat. I should do some fan art or something for you guys, dude. Yeah, do some, 
Do some, uh... Yeah, do some fan art. Oh, hey, so... SAO Kirito69, I love... I love your name. <laughs> um... Yeah, it's, uh... I don't know, I haven't played D&D Skirmish, but... Game's pretty... Game's pretty simple, it's just a... 5v5 little skirmish game on a hex grid, so it's kind of like War Machine a little bit. Because I guess it's... I guess War Machine is also 5v5. It was my ignorance. Um, but it's uh, made to be fast-paced 20-minute gameplay. There's 80 robots in the game. Uh, you choose a team of five, and you bring them into battle, and you can combine them together, like Voltron, depending on which ones you bring in. Uh, so pretty much all the robots can combine together into various combinations. Um, it's a lot more feasible than it sounds. It's like Pokemon meets Voltron. And that's my little spiel on the game. I wish Mong has really good line art, but I kind of wish he would add varying line thickness to these. Zoom. I have no idea what I'm doing. I say that as I'm trying to draw a single straight line. This is exactly what you tune into Zephyr Stream for, peeps. Um. Yeah, seems good. It's... Yeah. And this eye. I bet I, I need to do something with these eyes. Because the eye, I like the eyes on all the other ion robots. But this one came out a little weird. It's mostly because... I'm not sure. Kind of let Mong have at it. But it came out looking very different from the other ones, but not in a good way. I didn't really ever like the eyes on this. This is also just me being a little nitpicky. Uh, I was watching a South Park documentary about how they made that one 2008 election episode in six days. Or actually, it was actually how they made this human, the human Sentai Pad episode. And... And uh, the... Uh, the South Park guys said something pretty profound. It's like they make all these episodes in about a week. And if they spend the Trey or Matt, one of them said, I could have spent four weeks on this, but then the episode would have only been about 5% better. So it's good just to finish things and ship them out and then learn for next time. Uh, this is me doing the opposite of that. <laughs> and adjusting very minor details that only I will notice. Um... I guess more people will notice because uh, this one definitely didn't need as much TLC as one of the other ones I did earlier this week. Where is one of those? I can show you. This will be cool show and tell. I actually did... I should have streamed while I was doing this. I was in a coffee shop earlier this week. Snow completely snowed out. And I decided to redo some of the Aegis art. Where we have... This guy and this guy, which I will now count as two different robots. Um, this flying bomber plane was is the robot for Commander Poppet, who is ah. Huh, I guess I'm using a version of this file that doesn't have the commander art in it. Whatever. Poppet is a frilly princess who is kind of rambunctious, and she's obsessed with bombs, and she has, like, filigree corset on her. And so this robot, this robot was very, very clean and innocuous. Um, it didn't really look like her or anything that she would use. So I went in and I added, like, some cracks and stuff. Show that she's, she's kind of like, she, she's a, she flies solo. And she kind of is like a one-woman versus the world kind of character. So she's probably been using this robot for a while and it's kind of beat to hell but it has like this uh, gold filigree and this gold trim around it um i put little hearts on her guns one of them says like love nova and uh kind of just added more detail to the face and yeah it just added more like goldy bronzy color to the whole thing and so i went because i wanted the the for the commander robots especially the commander robots have to match the commanders and that is something i think people will notice but once I add the green, once I add the green dilly doos to this, see he already looks a little bit more like uh, Rios. 
Um, I added these these little ridge things over here. I wonder what the lore reason is for that. Oh, why the commander? Well, I guess why does Rios's robot have to look like him? Because he kind of like his whole lore is that he just kind of punches them in the face and then hijacks them from his enemies. Maybe these robots kind of change shape and form depending on who puts their essence in them. Because I like that trope in robot shows. These robots are kind of techno organic. I forget if I cover. I don't think I cover this, but. I was on, we were we we're kind of organizing out the lore for the game, and one of the I found I finally dug up a bunch of the documents about what these robots are, and we did actually write all this down at a point um, for per the purposes of writing like short stories and blog posts, but then like fell through the cracks between you know actually making the game and stuff. Uh, but one of the the main thing about these robots, and I'm pretty sure this is still canon because I make the canon, um, is that the planet the, re the the planet that the game takes place on, Sigaya, which is Aegis backwards, and that was something I actually finally settled on during the Kickstarter. Uh, so Aegis backwards, Sigaya. The planet they're on is called Sigaya, and Several hundred or several thousand years before the show, um, humanity sent out these self-evolving robots to terraform planets so humans could live on them. Um, and so, but they sent them way far ahead of time. So, like you know, they sent them out five hundred, a thousand years ahead of time to terraform a planet so they could get the job done. And then by the time humans actually arrived there on their ships, the planet would all be nice and set up. Uh, so, but the robot's like, yeah, they self-evolve into various shapes and sizes, and then they went dormant when the planet was done terraforming, and humans settled on the planet of Sigaya, and they kind of just forgot about them. They didn't really know what they were. They just, um, they just saw, like, all these kind of junky robots laying around in the dirt all the time as, like, kind of like a landscape fixture, and they probably knew that. They probably had, like, little history books that told them these robots were just kind of sent here, but now they're useless because they finished their purpose, really old technology anyway. But then eventually someone figured out how to use them for fighting, because the planet had kind of devolved into lots of infighting and civil wars. And that leads us to the current story. And because of their whole self-evolving techno-organic thing, they're very... That's why they can kind of combine to meet certain tasks. Um, in this game's case, uh, the commander's will to fight a certain way. I think the robots were originally sent over in their level 5 forms as like these giant machine gods. But then upon reaching the planet, they broke down into a bunch of littler robot pieces. As to kind of... Uh, do human maintenance on the planet to make it habitable. I don't know what the story is about. All of these factions who are trying their best to figure out how to recombine them because they are robots of incredibly great power. Want to have the giant planet morphing robot on your side. Yeah. Okay, let's see. I like how I never really gave these these art these color schemes are actually pretty close to one another. I forget if I did that or if Mong did that. I think this robot might have been like a darker purple or a bluer purple when I first got it. And then I like did some fast adjustments to at least try to make it the same purple as Rios's gauntlets or something close to it. So maybe that was actually me, and that's why the colors are reasonably similar. I understand. Check chat. And let's see, the um... Looks like Sarah found the chat. So Sarah is now um, 
fiddling and chat with you guys, which is good. So I hope you guys enjoyed the lore of uh that's the that's that's the basic lore story for Aegis, yeah. Sent these robots to this planet way ahead of time. You guys people got there, didn't really know what they were. And then when by the time people actually understood what they were, they were like, Oh man, we can use these for fighting. And yeah. Robots more forms based on the will of the person controlling them. And there's all sorts of different types. This is actually kind of kind of inspired by Die Buster a little bit. Uh, if anyone's ever seen Die Buster, that had a kind of a we made a self-evolving robot and then forgot about it for twelve thousand years um, subplot. But that's like spoilery for anyone who's never seen it. If you've ever seen Gunbuster? If you've never seen Gunbuster, definitely watch Gunbuster and then watch Die Buster. They're just as good as Grenlagen, if not better. And it's made by the same studio. And a lot of stuff from Gernlagen was directly from uh, Gunbuster and Die Buster. Die Buster was actually made... They probably finished Die Buster and then moved almost immediately into Gernlagen pre-production, honestly. They were, they were only like a few years apart. Yeah, they made Fully Coley and then they made Die Buster and then they made Gernlagen. So Die Buster is like, kind of like this halfway between Gernlagen and Fully Coley. Then Gun and then Gunbuster came out in the eighties, but it's very very important. You have to watch Gunbuster first. Very very quality show, and the plots tied together, and you won't, you'll, you. It's not. It's very hard to. Gunbuster is uh, Die Buster is beautiful, but it's a lot of the entire plot basically relies on the context that you've seen Gunbuster, and if you haven't, it's like you still kind of get it, but. The ending has like no impact whatsoever if you haven't seen Gunbuster first. Let's see here. Gunbuster. Gunbuster. Also, how did SAO Kirito find my stream? Is it just because I went live on Twitch and then they advertise you? I don't even know how this works, to be completely honest. Unless they saw me on Twitter. That would also be a thing. I haven't even posted that I'm live on Facebook. <sighs> That's usually where we get most of like my Goonie friends come in. They'll be like... Hey, B is for kettle. Today I'm in the little closet and I'm just doing the big doing human stuff. Just for you. You specifically, you the listener. Yeah. I mean, okay. Actually, I don't really have that many. It's just that, like, the artist who did this has, like, this really sweet way of. He's, like, swishy swashies all over the metal and like I just don't know how to do that <laughs> um I don't know how to do that so to make it seem natural and then uh Mong kind of does that but he does it more with his shadows whereas this guy does it with his highlights so it's kind of like Mong and uh Mong and Dan the two artists are like yin and yang at least in terms of how they do lighting Alright, so I fiddled with this guy, let's keep him up. And then I'll probably do more to him. Very likely. But now I'll move over here. And let's hide pop it. I actually really like how I think the face might be too yellow a little bit, but I really like how those guys came out. Pop you away. Alright, now how do I do this? Uh, how do I uh, stretch my back? How do I... Draw... 
That's exactly what you tune in to hear the artist say. 100%. Also, I'm on this very restrictive hoodie. I will now get off. And while I strip the hoodie off, I will look at the chat. Kyo Ninja for Hire is now auto hosting you. Oh, I love you. Um, let's see here. You know, he looks a little mad worldy. Oh, yeah, what, big fist guy? Oh, it's because he has, like, the black and white hair. It's a little ridiculous. Skunk hair. Ugh, poor Platinum. They exist, the, their first gig was getting screwed by Sega. And they... And they got rescued a bit by Nintendo, and then Nintendo screwed them by making them make a bad Star Fox game. And we all know if Platinum was just left to their completely, completely to their own devices to make a Star Fox game, the game would have been incredible. And it's like, it's really just not rocket science to make a damn Star Fox game. You know, they would have done it perfectly. But then Nintendo's like, no, you gotta put in this really weird control scheme that no one wants. It's just sad. And like, they made Wonderful 101 and no one fucking bought it. Game's game's a marvel. Really, really cool. But I guess it was like kinda looked like a kid's game. But it was definitely too hard to be a kid's game these days. But then it also it would look like an action game, but no one no serious gamers actually owned a Wii U really. Because Wii U sold what, like ten copies? Um but nevertheless, yeah, Wonderful 101 did not do very well for them, even though it was one of the most original and really cool action games ever made. And it had so much to it that no one, and probably no, not many people ever really discovered, unless they were like diehard, like Devil May Cry people, who were playing the game. Alright. How do I... I'm going to redraw... I lost... Layer 21. Okay. Yeah. So this is my... This is my art layer. Let's see... Is I draw the most uncomfortable position possible? Oh yeah, can you guys even hear that music in the background? I actually forgot that I had YouTube playing in the background. If you can't hear it, I would be happy to turn it up because it gives me life. And me having life means Aegis will come out. So, very good things. Very good things if I have life. Shape dynamics. Brush settings got turned off between files. This is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Okay. So how do I make this little robo gunner ship look cool? So that's the question of the day. I'm actually listening to Steven Universe music in the background, so it's a great show. But as usual, Tumblr ruins everything, so I can understand if anyone's ever been turned off by it. I like it because it's pink Dragon Ball Z. Like, you know, it's been hijacked by some really weird people online. How do you make Ender 100 look cool? These are the questions I ask myself. It's kind of like just a basic gunner ship. You have to make it look kind of sweet. And one way to do that is, so sometimes when I, when I have to redraw like a little guy, I'll actually go out, I'll go down and I'll find, 
Where's Big Face? Uh, Ender 5000. Thanks. And, uh, turn off you. Turn off you. All right. So I have this goon, who is like the final evolution of this blue guy up here. So if I like reverse engineer that guy's art, which was done at a decently later date, and therefore looks a little bit more detailed. Into back into level one, I could do that. So it looks like that robot specifically. So what's he? So let's see. What does Ender One Hundred do? Um, it flies. It can move a decently long range. And it shoots people with machine guns. It is the most basic e type that we have. Um, it has this kind of long tail thing. But what I could integrate is this kind of little wing, this little wing dealie that I totally put on the shoulders of uh, the big guy. Because none of the other vendors kind of have that. I can like kind of have that retrofit and then like <sighs> also that bit interesting problem is that something that I've been running into with like how to advertise the game is like obviously we want to advertise it on one hand, you want to advertise it with, like, the little basic robots. But they're, by the nature of the art style, they're not very hard, they're not very easy to make look very, very sweet. So we just use, like, the A-types a lot to advertise. But on the other hand, I guess we, then we use, like, the giant combined robots. And I want to, I don't think that's misleading, but... Like, if I could go back in time... I don't know, maybe I would have done something a little bit differently with the basic robots. Maybe I would have made them all humanoid, but humanoid in different ways. Kind of like metabots. Uh, I don't want to do that now. Seems like a lot of work in it. I'd rather just make a different game instead if I were to do that. So Aegis's art direction is what you see is what you get at this point. But it's also not that bad. I do like a lot of aspects of Aegis as art director because all the robot classes do look so incredibly different. But they're just not. Sometimes they're not just not super mascotable, even though they're very Pokemon-y. Or maybe they're too po or either they're too Pokemon-y, where somebody's like, "These robots are too cute. They don't look like my Gundams or my Battle Techs." Sometimes they are not. Cute enough. That's not true. All the robots are always just about as cute as they can be. Control T. Control shrink. Give me more space to do the stuff. One thing I haven't really increased, one thing I haven't really improved on the last few years that I wish I improved on more is perspective. Do you think I would have been? I definitely am better than I was, but I'm definitely not a master like uh, Mong, the other robot artist, can just put things in. Marvelous perspective. That's like his whole what really drew me to him. He had a really good sense of sense of design, and he had a really good sense of perspective, where he can put things in very dynamic poses from very dynamic angles. Where I am more of a I will draw you this from front, side, and back type person. So putting things in really cool uh, 
perspectives has never really been in my wheelhouse of uh, artistic abilities. And it's something I wish I were better at. But I have like this thing where like I look at something and like my brain tells me I just want it to be symmetrical. I want it to be evenly cut and stuff. So it's hard for me to like do outrageous proportions. Welcome to Breeze's Tell All Art Stream. This is what happens. I'm left to my own devices to do stream stuff. But what's really cool is what's going on outside of the door this is even more exciting because we've gotten like five or six different quotes from manufacturers this week. Um, we are asking around to a lot of different places because now we're trying to, now it's our job to figure out the manufacturing logistics. Still not quite sure what our relationship with Greenbrier is, but either way, it has been made very clear that they are not going to, uh, or they don't have the bandwidth right now to, uh, help with this sort of thing. So we're going to run our own Kickstarter through our own account, where it's our job to work out all the numbers. And it's actually not as hard as you'd think. I kind of regret not just doing this years ago. It's all about... I kind of thought when we signed on with a publisher, um, they would be super competent and just take care of it. Just take care of the whole game and it would be great. Uh, and I just could hand it over to them. And then it would just be our job at Zephyr Workshop just to design extensions and stuff. And the game would just like kind of make itself uh, very naive. Well, I guess that's how it is. That's totally how it does work at a lot of publishers, but um, not so much with ours. They have very many large and crazy projects going on, and not enough time for Agus. Is very sad. So, but I think we're, we're getting quotes, and we are looking at putting the whole game in one box as opposed to two boxes, which is pretty much, I think, what 90% of people want anyway, since judging by the people who backed our last Kickstarter, um, a vast majority of the people just went for the 80 or $100 tier, because no one really knew what they were choosing from anyway. So we might we might just put the whole game in one box, which actually is uh, monumentally cheaper production wise, as far from everything that I've seen so far. I may be very wrong, but it is monumentally cheaper to do uh, two thousand copies of one box rather than two thousand copies of two boxes, which is actually four thousand copies. It will also allow our goal on Kickstarter to be not like forty thousand dollars it'll allow it it'll allow it uh, depending on what good quotes we get it will allow uh the game to uh score for a much lower number and therefore probably overfund by a lot more as opposed to like making a scraping attempt to get to uh 40k and then like um not having a lot of wiggle room in terms of financials in case something ends up being like five cents more than we thought it was. And plus that also leaves us room for much better stretch goals, honestly. If we have one box and we fund it, this is not a final number at all, but if we fund it, say, like 20k, um, that means we can, we've, we have a few different creative ideas. We can be more creative with stretch goals, I think, because we're not worried about uh, the logistics of finishing up two boxes, changing things in two boxes. Picking lots of quotes on different materials, um, different material upgrades. People, uh, some a lot, I remember a lot of comments on the first Kickstarter about, uh, well, actually, not even on the first Kickstarter, really just from like minis games players I know in real life who know about the game. They're just like, well, why doesn't the game have minis? I don't want cardboard standees. What happens if I spill stuff on them? Well, don't spill stuff on your minis either, dude. But uh, we can upgrade the materials to linen 
punch boards, and then they'll have kind of like the same material that uh, Battlecon and a bunch of other games. It's a very, very robust, awesome punch board. And we'll see what that costs on the outgo, or if we just set that as like the first stretch goal or something. So the idea is to make every all the parts of the game have really, really good uh, materials, which is uh, definitely that's what is being discussed out there right now. It's great. Stretch goals. Probably still no minis. I can't lie to you guys. There are probably not be minis in this game unless we do exceptionally well and then we will have mini expansion. Because like we don't have the funds to um even summon somebody to make miniatures models for us to just even CGI ones. I guess we do, but then that becomes a whole nother huge shipping logistics question of um or it just adds lots of logistics to everything. We add miniatures to the game to just kind of ship, do its best. And then miniatures can definitely come later. We have no shortage of people who know how to model miniatures. And Greenbrier themselves actually know a lot about making miniatures. And that would be something that we could definitely work with them on. But it is a little worrisome because it appears that the only way to get funded on Kickstarter with a kind of game that isn't just a party game is to have miniatures. So we'll see how it goes. Of course, I will be relying on you, you specifically, listener, to help spread the word about how pretty good the game is and how it's very cool and how... If we do one box this time around, you'll be getting an astronomical amount of content, like a Pokemon amount of content, out of this box. And the idea is to pitch it as it's like not a one guy. One guy on tabletop Kickstarter advice after I like was getting doing a postmortem on this. He was like, "Well, why is the game so expensive? Legendary gives you 600 cards. It's a deck building game." Well, game's not a deck building game. That's not really a war game either. So it's kind of like this uh, game that sits in the middle of everything and it scratches a bunch of itches. So if we advertise the game with a hundred cards, that sounds unimpressive because people think it's a card game. And now uh, this is just me like brain. This is me braining on you, listener. Um. So I don't want people to think it's a card game, but if we advertise as a war game, then we annoy the people who pretty much have their entire lives based around uh, buying and wanting sweet miniatures. And I don't want them. But I know there must be someone out there who just wants to play a strategy game that just has, you know, good gameplay. <laughs> and give you some solid assets to play a really good strategy game with without needing to buy in like $500 because of miniatures. Or wanting something to play that isn't just a card game because Card games are very overdone these days. So the idea, the hardest part is, I never really thought, people I, people I pitch the game to in real life understand the game just fine, but it's so weird trying to pitch the game to people online. I mean, it's just much harder for some reason to get them to like grok the idea of what the game is. It's just a sweet strategy game that you can play that doesn't have a huge buy-in. And we give you a ton of gameplay content, because that's always been the goal. I just want to give you a ton of gameplay content so you can play crazy robot fire emblem on a board. Check chat. Check chat. 3-2 is now hosting you. Yeah, like, the, I was watching, um two of the miniatures games. I was like browsing Kickstarter earlier and some of the miniatures, some of the games that are currently trending right now, one of them has like $50,000 and they're the first day in. And just because like their banner ad, this tells me nothing other than includes 74 miniatures. And it's just like, sweet, I guess. 
it does as far as I'm concerned, maybe the game is awful and maybe the game maybe we don't even need a game. Maybe we should have just made robot miniatures collectible uh product and made up a game afterwards. Maybe that is what we will try to do in the future. No, nope. made up Aegis as a good game first and foremost. But people really want that uh, value proposition in their product, and value proposition on Kickstarter means we give you ass loads of plastic. Well, speaking of which, we are talking to... We're trying to find a good way to meet in the middle. Um, there's a great company that we're talking to that makes uh, plastic standees. Like clear plastic standees. So they're, they're standees, but they're plastic, and you get the art for the robots printed on them. And they look really, really cool. But might be a logistical nightmare. Um, we have the costs kind of land out. Uh, maybe a very high stretch goal. Probably very, very high. Um, it probably require special logistics from the manufacturer. Because one company would produce these plastic flat miniatures and the other one... And our manufacturer would have to like put them in the boxes. Or we have them available as a special add-on um, after a certain point. Like if we uh if we hit said stretch goal, that means we are able to produce um so many miniatures. So so many of these sets of plastic miniatures and we can sell them separately, which would also be good and solve a lot of the logistical issues. <laughs> Ender 100 is fat. <laughs> Pudge. Um, does not look nearly as nimble. I would want him to. I'm just your problem. Let's see. There's one kind of sketch. I'll redo that. Uh, other Zephyr Workshop news. We're finished. We're making good progress on another kind of side gig we're doing to generate money to run the Kickstarter with. Building a sweet digital uh, exhibit for a museum. Um, so if you know anyone else who needs something digital built, uh, hit us up. We can make all sorts of things, do all sorts of graphics and whatnot. Uh, websites, all that. But yeah, so we're making good headway on that. It should be finished. It's scheduled to finish right at the end of uh, February. Is also might be the time to launch the Kickstarter if everything is correct. We're getting some new board art. I sent off the board art uh, description, uh, the the asset list and all the things I would want from said board art to the artist right before this stream. You know, that ball's in that court. Uh, we'll see if we can get him to respond. Everyone pray the Mong chant. And, uh, we get some sweet board art there, because with sweet board art, we can manually print that stuff out. We can make better gameplay videos, because our current ones are a little shaky, Cammy. Um, have a better looking demo to show people, as opposed to like a big square of sand. Uh, and make the game more impressive at uh, length, at uh, a distance, I think. So, that happened. I made up the video, I made up the uh, the style, the, the guide for the video for the new Kickstarter. And I sent that off a few days ago, so that's very good. Um, very special video guest, the guy who did the Giga Robo campaign. Uh, 
So he he is in theory going to uh, help us out with this video. And we're also going to get the Aegis theme extended to a minute and 40, probably, because that will be the rough length of the new video. Um, so that's also very exciting. Um, we will also offer the Aegis, M the, the Aegis theme MP3 as a goal again, that uh, as a backer tier again, or, done or something. And that's, uh, yes. I'm actually pretty hyped for that. I really like the Aegis theme. And I should really just set it to my ringtone. It's actually, I would, if anyone has never had their own... If anyone's never had their own uh, ringtone, I mean, had their own theme music composed for them before by somebody, I would suggest it. It is the coolest. Um, makes a great gift for somebody. <laughs> if you go and uh, get your friend or your mom or your girlfriend their own music um, composed by a lovely composer, that I could that I can redirect you to quite a few of them actually. I know quite a few very good art and very good music people. Uh, yeah, it's uh, sweet. Yeah, definitely get your own music theme track composed. You know, regardless of how, regardless of how well he just does, I will always have that theme. I will always have the Aegis theme. And, uh, like, that is mine forever. And I will have, uh, my own anime opening that I made for something. Or the, that was made for something that I made. So, let's. Move this guy's head up a bit. Maybe I'll do something like this. Sounds like people are throwing stuff around and dropping stuff all over the office. Always good. They wouldn't do that. I'm trying to figure if that's angry talking, like if somebody accidentally broke something. Always good. <laughs> uh -huh. Whatever, I'm in my hole. Uh, breeze, breeze is in his hole and all is right with the world. We'll stay here. Forever. Money. <laughs> Reading the chat right now. Sarah. <laughs> All right, that explains a lot. Um Yeah, personal music would be great. Personal music is very great. Uh the going rate for your average composer is apparently $500 a minute of composed music. So, it's a little pricey. Uh, our guy is the coolest, and he really just wants to compose music. So we talked him down a little bit, but it's still not the most budget thing in the world. It's like actually incredible how yeah, this like comes out of like yeah, as if for workshop money, but it's still really interesting to think about how uh, what you call it. Some people spend like a hundred fifty dollars a week, like eating out or like you know boozing around, or. Any number of other things, like a vacation or something. $150 can buy you a, a plane ticket somewhere sometimes. I chose to have a theme song made. <laughs> um, just uh, sometimes I think about it. It's just like not something that apparently, that not, not really, just something that not normal people don't really do. Is have uh, put money into board game development. Or development of anything, really. They just kind of like spend their money on like stuff. Dog food. For a dog. 
or dog leash. No, I. I have my own. I have my baby, my little robot baby. Also, wins. You guys are healed about. You guys will hear about Wednesday. I actually love to get that game up on tabletop. So, game's sweet. Just gonna spend the rest of the stream talking about Wednesday. I don't really know how to, how do I do perspective? Do I like stuff out there? Um, let's see. So, I'll probably do something like this. Or this guy. Weirdest thing though is it's hard to like see what the actual shape is. Like, is this guy like this thin if you see him in the front? Or like this. Yeah, I don't really know how to draw. That's one of the things that I find hardest to draw. I find, I find it very hard to draw cylinders and ovals in perspective. That's my weakness. You found it. Probably also why I'm wrong. Chooses to draw mostly, uh, you know, prism, prismatic objects. Then we got Poop Butt down here. Go 100. He's so cute. He is the robot that outlined the design for all other G-types. And, um... So G-types don't usually have articulated knees. They have, like, little hydraulic pistons and they hop around. Or they have little hamster legs and they, like, waddle. Crawl. That's the, that's the legit. So that kind of all came from this guy, because he's got little uh, piston waddly legs. And then there's, he has, he has like a brother named the Go 400, which has slightly better art, but also he's still very simple. No, I don't want to resize you. Bad. That's very far. You remain. That's what happens, you just start doing art in the source file. So this guy is going to become him, and I'll probably do something better with his guns too, but I'll get back to that. His guns, he, under 100 can have better guns. Um, yeah, go. Go is... Go is denoted by having two eyes, two vertical eyes, either a big one or a small one, or a small one or a big one, and having them be the same shape. Uh, and a large head with kind of like these uh, hamster ears on top. Very tank looking. If Go could turn into a Jaeger. From Pacific Rim, they would all become Journal Alpha. So look forward to uh, a, Ye a level three go in the future. Will probably resemble Journal Alpha a little bit. We have a we have a level two go. That's not really he exists and he actually is printed on a card. But I'm not sure if he's included in the in the first set. Maybe he will be if we increase the number of cards in the first set through stretch goals or something. But yeah, we do have a go level two. Maybe I'll show you guys. This has old art, and I could actually stand to redo this guy's art, too. There he is. He's so cute. He has little pile driver hands and a cube-like arm. And a like, cube-like head. But yeah, I like the overall design, and this is uh, an example of something that I would totally be able to draw much better these days. Like, it would end up looking very similar, but the art would be bigger and better. More refined. Of course, I was drawing a 400 layer. Batting a thousand today. It's been one week since you looked at me. Uh, 
Uh-oh. I made a new file now. So control shift and there we go. Check chat. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Personal theme music. <laughs> so we have art. Me message. Be back in one minute. In the meantime. I could tell. Can I, am I able to talk to Sarah through this chat? I mean, through the stream, because I think she's. Well, I post the live now picture on Facebook. There we go. There we go. Okay, so, and then now I can share it onto my wall and then things. All right, so what do I want to do with you? Hamster man. Make you sweet. I'll make you strong. I'll make you powerful. Or I could just draw over you and keep the exact same silhouette and just refine everything about you. Funk, funk. Thank you, the viewer, for always listening in to me. I hope I am a. I hope I am an entertaining orator, an orator, an orator. Big thing about it, let's see, what does Go do in the actual game? He has a head ram. He rams people with his head. Uh, and that is the coolest thing. It's the main weapon. He also has like a little cannon, but it's less relevant. Probably should just have a stupid pushy head thing. But the cannon can also do work sometimes, and it's also a very low energy investment to do the cannon. Ooh. I mean, that's why he gets his super big head from. All the other G's have super big heads, too. Only the Go has big, dumb head man thing. I actually very much appreciate doing this. It lets me just cut loose for a little bit and do something that I enjoy doing. I would also suggest. Yeah, that's why everyone. Never really understood streaming for the longest time. Because I'm an old fuddy duddy. Like, I, no, 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 I never understood why people would, like, yeah, stream there. Like, I'm playing, uh, I'm playing Hearthstone. Watch me play Hearthstone. Like, I couldn't imagine anything less interesting than watching you play Hearthstone. But, you know, maybe people do it because, you know, for, like, you know, self, uh, self-gratifying reasons. It gives you an excuse to do something you like. And the fact that some other people might watch puts you on some kind of schedule. It makes you want to do something. That's personal expectation. It's like everybody loves some structure in their lives.
kind of what I like about this stream. After the Kickstarter, we kind of decided to do like this Wednesday stream thing. We didn't really know what we're doing. It's another. That's all like another instance where we're just always learning all the time about things. Jesse and Kettle know all about streaming. They stream. They watch stream. Uh, but I didn't. Sarah didn't. I think Sarah watches. I had never really watched any. Games. I was like, you know, streaming, you know, I guess all the kids are doing it these days. It's a real, it's actually a much more interesting and effective way to be in touch with people who care about what we do, is to stream. It's much better than just posting, like, the occasional picture on Facebook about, like, trust us, we promise we're working. We always are. But everyone gets tired of. We have not sent out an email. We've never sent it. I don't think we've sent out a newsletter, though, to like our email list thing that we stream every one day. I'm very disappointed in our email list. We actually didn't get many backers from our email list. And we've had been collecting emails from very recent events right prior to the Kickstarter from people who played and enjoyed the game. But, I don't know. Who knows? Will, it will be different next time. Kickstarter page is coherent. And the value proposition and assets and videos all look better. Definitely hard to compete on Kickstarter these days. Everyone's games look so freaking cool. They're all made by people with like full time jobs and they make like six figures a year. Like, I'm gonna sink all of my money into making a game like Folklore because I'm a doctor. I will just pay a buttload of money to have like AAA games required. And now uh, we do this all with our hands. We're not rich. We're barren. We're only a few years out of college. And we do this. Put a lot of effort into it. And a lot of the better games out there are made by people who are much older than us. We have been doing this for a while. But now we are this little fledgling. So far, everything works out pretty well. Every time we've done stuff ourselves, things have worked out fine. Every time we've relied on other people to do stuff for us, things have not worked out fine. I think that's just a rule of life. Don't beg for things. Get it yourself or you won't get anything. Now we're just doing it all ourselves. Give you guys an awesome game. We have any number of people out there who can offer us their sage advice. Did we ever need it? Chris Bedell. Giga Robo Guy, Greenbrier. Level 99. Uh, Brad Tallman was actually a big help to us during our Kickstarter. He took the time to write out very good feedback from our. Uh, about our campaign. Of course, we have some have a very good friend at Cryptozoic, whose entire job and existence is to run Kickstarters. So this time we will get feedback from people before putting the campaign up. That was also not our fault the first time, by the way. Um, how do I want to draw your body? Uh, I kind of want to like. 
to like, we like draw it so that it's really obvious that there's like a giant hydraulic thing behind his head because that'd be cool. Because his attack in the game is called Hydraulic Head Ram. I'll zoom out a little bit. To get the overall idea of what the silhouette is. Usually I draw, usually I end up scribbling out the whole body first and then doing like the silhouette or whatever. Uh, I don't know why I didn't do that this time. Because raisins. For no reason, I am big brain. Uh, big brain am winning again. Every time I draw it's a different experience. Like life is like a box. Photoshop is like a box of chocolates. <laughs> You never know. One of the cool things that's coming up for me is that I get to, uh, I get to help, like, co-teach or go and present in a class at, uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, which is, um, the next best thing to MIT, as I, be I believe is how they build themselves. Uh, and there's a tabletop game design and publishing class uh, that's new there, which is fascinating because they're a technical school. And everyone there is a top-notch programmer as far as I can tell. But it's funny that uh, their school, and not our liberal arts alma mater, Becker College, uh, has the tabletop, has the tabletop uh, class. But, whatever. I will be... So yeah, I'll be speaking about that, about manufacturing and Kickstarter and all sorts of stuff. So, I have gotten to the point where I can speak in academia about how to publish tabletop games. That inspires hope. <laughs> oh, I will just try to do my best. Look about game business. The business of making games at Becker a few weeks ago. That was pretty good. Did not did not hate that. <sighs> um Let's see. And it's stronger than you. Actually, this guy's feet are nicely posed. It looks like he's actually reasonably well balanced on the original art. Now watch me screw that up in the new art. Yeah, let's get the whole picture down. So let's see. Where do I want this guy's feet to be? Let's put feet one, feet here. He's going to see me true power. Do art. Plan things out properly. Maybe. Pub him. But I don't pretend to build myself as an artist. I just draw because I like it. I hope other people like it. To design robots. Should always do things like.
Let's How do I make you into the poster boy for all G-types? You have many standards to live up to. Go 100. Your head's too small, for example. Too bigger. Right, Fox, you're the coolest. Oh my god. Something out there totally just broke again. Should be more careful. Instead of playing roller derby. You guys are done out there. Jesse and Kettle can probably go home for the night. Not sticking around and like breaking the office. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually very nice to see you in the stream all the time, Fox. It gives me life. Two, two, three, two. Did I stop talking? Maybe I was just talking to myself in my head. Interesting. Now my computer is burning my leg. I don't know if anyone can hear that fan, but it's most concerning, but whatever. Nothing ever got done without self-harm. I don't know if that's actually true. Don't follow my... You can probably get things done without self -help. Let's see here. As if it makes you happy. I 
Like a cop man, meat wad, time to rock it out now. Meat wad, make the money, see? Meat wad, make the money, is G. Drive in my car, living like a star. Why are some of my fingers and my toes and like my toes? Check, check it. What teams? Make the homies say ho oh, and the girlies want to scream. This is the part where I suffer deprivation of exhaustion and water deprivation. Hard scene with adult swim shows. Finishing something is very hard. It has no context here whatsoever, but it's also life. Looking cute. Pretty similar to the last one. Funny enough, his head actually ended up a very similar shape by accident. I didn't actually realize. I made uh, his head like this fish shape. I just scroll up and I'm like, oh, the old one's head. Maybe that's why it looks so natural. The old one's head was like that. Very good. Very good. Reads. Make it a little bit different. Everyone says it's worse than Gunbuster, but I think they are part of the same whole. It's like saying that my forearm is better than my upper arm. It's like you can't really compare them. They're also just so attached. But some people just really don't like. Some people just really don't like. Uh, I met some people who really don't like Gunbuster. I don't know why. I think it's one of the most beautiful animated things ever made. Incredible, incredible art direction. All the props, all the robots, everything was designed. There wasn't a single, I swear there wasn't a single thing in that show that wasn't designed or planned out. There was no like stupid filler background stuff where they just told the art to ham it in. Like everything from like stupid chip bags to uh, every costume for everything was planned out. They probably had enough concept art for that show. Make it a 26 episode series. No problem. So many characters they planned out. It was like almost like needlessly large cast. Which most of them didn't really have any speaking lines until like the final episode anyway. But they had like this whole universe planned out with all these different Buster Machine pilots. Like all these different places. Locations and factions. They managed to definitely probably bit off a little bit more than what they could chew in terms of just making it a six episode series. But it, it was good. It was just really good. I can appreciate the level of effort and time they put into it. You just don't see that in shows now. Yeah, when the last time I saw actually the Kabanari last year, the or, yeah, last year, the um, the zombie show about their it's zomb Walking Dead meets Snowpiercer. Kambanari of the Iron Fortress. That was pretty good. With uh, the art direction, at least. The show is actually, like, remarkably stupid. But it was also really, really good at points. Animation was definitely top-notch. But I really appreciated it because... They put a lot of effort, just like Die Buster, into developing the universe that the show took place in. Lots of interesting settings and cool character designs that are all very separate from one another, even if I 
Right it's like it definitely didn't have that much effort put into it compared to Die Buster though, because you know they had lots of like guys in the background, or totally just like they just told like the in between artists or whatever to like okay draw like fifty Japanese peasants here, or draw some really generic samurai looking guys here. But for the most part, a good vast majority of the people who were had screen time in that show looked great. They had the very elaborate. And I think that's that's definitely what allures me to a lot of things, is how much effort and thought that they put into the design of this thing. I don't even care if it's the end result's good. I can I just appreciate the work. And that's how I always was as a kid. I cared a lot more about the production process behind something than the actual end product. So I used to collect art books. And I used to watch a lot of like behind the scenes movie stuff. This was back when I was like 10. Stuff that 10 year olds normally aren't very interested in, I think. So I like, the, I like just like the. Uh... That's kind of like what I want you just to be like. I want. That's why I do all these little tweaks to the character art and stuff that I get in from uh, folks. It's because I want the setting to read well without you having to look it up. I want the robots to read well without you having to look at it and look at a description for what they do. I want the G guys to look like tanks, but E guys to fly. I want the E characters to wear blue, and I want the A characters to wear red. I want their fashion to be very obvious of who they are and what they do. That said, a giant, a guy with giant metal arms and a tracksuit. I let slide because the design ended up being really funny and cool. But also shows that he's just kind of not really aligned up because there's such a big difference. Gerard's eye. Kinda of looks. Oh, well, let's do that thing that I always forget to do. That I always do after the stream. Re transform. Flip horizontal. <clears throat> this is where I kind of see seeing really weird stuff with the art. I don't know why. Take the trusty lasso tool and move the eyeball back a ball and transform it. See, that's why the drawing in digital is really neat because <clears throat> I'd never be able to catch this on paper unless you know you take the paper and you hold it up to the light and you can kind of see some distinct like skewing and perspective issues. But when you do it in um, digital, you can just take the you can just take the uh, the art after you're mostly done with it, and you just uh, start hacking at it with the with the uh, transform tools. You move your leg over here or something. A little bit more natural. Funny because I still like the legs on the old one better. Maybe I should have just taken the route of just painting the hell over the old one. Because it looks like this guy's design isn't really changing much anyway. I can just add new and sweet assets to um, the old one and have it look great.
What's here? Wonder if I Combiner against the iron flak. Track suits are always a Roller Derby sounds fun. We're practicing how the... Oh my god. Is that what you guys are doing out there? Are you doing Roller Derby? That's good. Let me sum up my phone again really quick. Touch something. Getting messages from people that I can't talk to because I'm in the middle of a stream, but robot art is being. Now I will share. I am doodling live. Right. Okay, back to the pencil grind. Huh. Hua! <sighs> Art is great. For some reasons and not others. I wonder what my music cycled to. Oh god. I went from like Steven Universe to stupid Undertale garbage. I'm sure Undertale's actually a great game, but like oh yeah, I probably can't play sweet music because it will detect that it's Regina Spectre. This is to people, but
Let's see. You are now listening to KWFM Breeze's Art Existential Crisis. Oh, actually, speaking of that, tomorrow night I'm going to be on a radio show at 9.30. Um, you saw the post on our Facebook. To WEMF.com, and uh, you can listen to me on this radio show called Citywide Blackout. It's a very cool thing. They interview lots of indie hipster people. I don't really know why they're interested in me. We were recommended by Michael Epstein of Copper Frog Games, who is a good friend and cohort of us. I guess he has been on the place before, but I seem a little out of place. I don't know. The guy who runs um, the guy who runs the uh, the radio show seems really cool though. He seemed to warm up to the idea of Pokemon meets Voltron very quickly. He was just like, "Oh, that sounds sweet." So he messaged me back in the middle of December. We kind of scheduled it out for yeah tomorrow, I guess. Yeah, January. <sighs> The best part is this computer is such a good space heater in such a small enclosure in really small quarters. Like I'm in a little three by three closet right now, in like one of the phone booths at our office, and normally it is very cold, but I can say that it is decently warm in here because my computer has been burning at probably like eighty degrees Celsius hot plus. <laughs> for um the last two hours. <laughs> yeah, citywide blackout tomorrow, in case you can't get enough of my voice. And uh mostly redundant you just Kickstarter news. But yeah, still on track to get that page up and looking pretty by the end of January. And then the launch date We'll, we'll iterate from there, and then the launch date will be strategically chosen. They're also, like, sending out to reviewers and stuff, too, still. We have some boxes that we have that we're, uh, that we're, like, still sending some reviewing copies out. Just in case. I reached out to some, um, reached out to some, uh, reviewers the other day. Like, uh, Marco Wargamer, who actually has a video with us. It has over a thousand views or so. It's like our most popular video, or most popular video on YouTube featuring Aegis. Is this uh, interview from Gen Con 2015. And yeah, a thousand people have watched it. And he specializes in covering war games and strategy games. So, I've been kind of hitting him up in every location that I can find. And hopefully he will want to look at what is the semi-final version of the game and give it a solid review. Because that's also something I missed missing last time. No good no good video reviews. This little kind of rules walkthrough is very not very exciting. Email a guy called Rado who does Rado Runs Through. Um, pretty much exclusively plays like Euro games and non non-conflict games. So he directed me to some other people, because I knew that we were going in, but I was hoping, yeah, he would, if he knew some other people who would be uh, interested, and he did, he directed us to some other folks that I have also contacted. I'll never understand people who don't want to play games with, don't want to want to play games. I will never understand people who just want to play games that have no conflict. Since I was raised on video games, it just baffles me. Like, don't all games have conflict? I guess not. Oh my god. <laughs> Please. Manually adjust.
My cat says hi. Hello, hello, three twos cat. Too famous. This far, no one can see me burning. But everyone can see me burning. Whoops. Sometimes I have to minimize and maximize Photoshop because the everything stops working. Not the worst, but amazing how. Uh, amazing how Adobe still has like kind of glitches like that, but maybe I just don't care. To be honest, I think Steven Universe is better at making pop music than actual pop stars. Especially this. This is like... I can totally picture this being like a Katy Perry song. I'm lost in. I'm walking. I'm Everybody needs a friend, and I've got you, and you, and you. So many, I can't even name them. Can you blame me? I'm too famous. Everyone can see me burning. How do I use the shift key lol? <sighs> I just tried to scroll the Photoshop window. That's actually really funny. Some people, yeah, just can't, maybe some people just can't play conflict games because it ruins friendships. So they only play co-op because it enforces friendships. So I wonder how fragile your friendship is so that you can't play games with the person. Some people get very, very into games though, and I guess that's no fault of their own. That's just how they are. Some people don't know how to communicate with others through. I think that games are a communication tool. When I play magic or I play chess, I view it as a dialogue between me and the other person. There's always there has to be like some give and take while we're playing. But some people are just like I'm gonna blitzkrieg you and you're gonna lose and you're not gonna do anything. I think I feel like that's if you replace, usually that kind of person is the kind of person who just has to win everything. They have to win every argument. They're usually very argumentative. 
You have to like point out where you're wrong at all points. But sometimes people will also let you in, and those are the people who um, care more about care about your feelings. Let's see here. Some people play games and they don't understand that other the, the other people around them just aren't having fun at all. Like they'll just specifically they'll see a miserable face on somebody and then they'll still continue to like say target that person or make it so they can't make decisions in the game anymore. I feel like that's also a very fascinating way to uh, play competitive games because you don't realize that you're hurting people. Like, when somebody plays a game with you, it's a time investment. The mutually understood contract that you're both going to have fun. That's a... And... and some people don't see it that way. They see it as, like, this is a thing that I have to win. And it's not fun unless I don't win. It's not fun if I don't win. And that's the whole point of this entire experience, is to win. But, like I said, it's like you can't win a conversation with somebody. And if you view games like a conversation, then you, um... Yeah, your goal isn't always to win, it's just to... make sure the other person has a good time. That's your responsibility as someone playing the game. Is you have a responsibility to make sure the other people have a good time, some way, shape, or form. That's my. Uh, thing about that's my philosophy on games. I mean, every Wednesday, Dries Grigus Psychology Power Hour. Oh, I accidentally saved the document. Whoops, <laughs> my bad. That's not that big a deal. Huh, I don't know if I like how this guy's turning out. What I might do after the stream is I think I'm gonna take aspects of the sketch and aspects of the original, and I might totally, like, kind of merge them together. What is this? Who plays? I actually never watched Gravity Falls, so this is lost on me. Where's Digimon? Didn't, didn't 2016 claim Koji Wada? Because I think he died, but I can't forget, I forget if that was at the end of 2015 or if it was in 2016. That was the worst, because Koji Wada was the best. And I think Butterfly is one of the greatest of all time. The GOE, one of the greatest all time uh, anime openings. Lord of, Lord of the Flies with trainable monsters. Digimon Adventure Zero One. It's good. I liked it.
I guess I'm trying to figure out... I'm also trying to figure out what to do for about... Every... Starting last year, every year I intend to make it to GDC, which is Game Developers Conference in San Francisco. It is a good time. However, you know, getting across the country and finding a place to stay for a week is very difficult. E-O-A-T anime opening. Actually, I kind of like how the head's coming out here. I kind of like this super piston thing. It adds, it adds moxie. That's what it adds. That's exactly the thing that it adds. It adds moxie. The soda. All goes in the game are actually, instead of being powered by the innocuous uh, an explicable green energy that all robots are powered by. It is powered by Moxie, and that's what makes Goes different. Did you ever drink Moxie? It's a powerful soda. It kind of tastes like after you brush, if you brush your teeth, and then you drink Coca-Cola. That's like what Moxie tastes like. If you like, you tried if you like drink Coke immediately after brushing your teeth. I've only had Moxie once in my life, but that's how I would describe it. I got a buzz. Who buzzed me? I'm waiting for me to accidentally tip this water all over my lap, my power cable. That would be good. We had a great technical issue here earlier in the week at Zephyr Workshop where Sarah's computer, where we do all of our business stuff, got coffee poured all over it and the computer exploded. Not that we didn't really lose anything, we didn't lose any files. But, because it's all like the hard drive's phase, we all just extract it all from the hard drive. And all of our and all of our actual decent stuff is all stored in the cloud somewhere. On like Google Drive and things like that. But, that was this, that was Monday. As, uh, we got destroyed, one of our computers got destroyed. So we are replacing it, and Sarah ordered this last night with a uh, HP ZBook 15U, which is a really, really cool computer. My computer is a HP EliteBook uh, 2760. It is made of steel, and it's made for being on the go and spilling crap on and dropping from great heights. It's like a baby proof computer. I also just like it because I intend to have these computers for a very long time. I don't really buy it new hardware more than once every like eight years. But and then uh my computer I had previous to this, which I still use and which is now Sarah's stand-in computer is a HP Elite book like eighty seven thirty. 
It's one of the first Elite books they made. Whereas my computer is dinky because it's a tablet. Uh, the other Elite book I have is a mobile workstation. So it is absolutely enormous and it weighs 10 pounds. It's also just this big steel brick. You know, for like professional usage, it has 1080p display, graphics card. It's just a good computer. And uh, so the one she got is the successor series to that, the Z-Book. The Elite Book series kind of, I, I did, this is what I learned yesterday, the Z-Book, the Elite Book series kind of split off into two different directions. Um, where the little tablet versions split off into, and they became the Revolve. And the big steel one became the Z-Book. Uh, so now all giant workstations are Z-Books. And I am jealous. One of these days I'll get one. Let's see. Is Breeze even looking at the feed? What's up? No, I'm not. Save early, save often. Epstein shows up and he's just very confused as to everything that's going on. The, we only we usually are able to check the feed because we have the chat open on a big TV or on a laptop that's next to me or whatever or on stream days we just have like four or three or four laptops and they're all like arranged in like a pentagram and that's how we bring you the stream every Wednesday uh, by summoning Satan but this this uh, stream is like, I'm just using my computer, I'm alone in a little space. Uh, so the only way for me to see the chat is to minimize Photoshop and re-maximize it. Do you remember Zoids, where you can take a really stock robot, add a giant cannon to it? That's what it feels like I'm doing now. It's like, I feel like the design is good without the cannon. But the robot in the game actually has a, has a mortar, so it needs to have a mortar. I remember being... I remember being like 11 or 12, and watching Digimon on Saturday mornings when Agumon first Warp Digivolved into War Greymon. It was like a defining moment of my life. That was very important. I feel like my whole life changed when I saw War Greymon come on screen. Crazy. Weird what shapes you. Could have been a doctor, but I watched Digimon instead. My whole, my whole dad's side of the family is all uh, like Jewish heart surgeons. I make board games. How about robots? Now the world has too many heart surgeons. Very. Recently, Era and I have been watching G Gundam. That's been the ritual. 
Breathe in Sarah ritual of uh, G Gundam. We're up to about a third of the way through. Actually, no, I guess I'll play, I'll probably play like six, like 17 ish. Schwartz Bruder just came in. Schwartz Bruder is the baller. So we have not gone to the Guyana Highlands yet. Watching Digimon is actually just the greatest. What I'm baffled by is the uh I love how much effort went into designing the robots for the Shuffle Alliance. But they only stick around for like an episode and a half. So good. These transforming crazy mobile suits that turn into like spades and diamonds. And I love how they kind of, and I guess in Gundam Build Fighters, they completed the set by making a King of Hearts transforming robot. So kudos to Sunrise for uh, tying up that loose end like 15 or 20 years later. <laughs> I was so happy. Sadly, you still can't buy toys for any of them. Probably like the most awesome toys that I would ever want to have out of G Gundam would be uh, the Shuffle Alliance. So I want why well, can't I, I want I want Master Grade Shuffle Alliance model kits. That's all I want. Maybe if I just manually looked up what a tank cannon looks like. Tank gun. Yeah. What the hell is that? Mighty looking gun. No, they have that they always have that like that opening at the end. That's very long and skinny. That's cool. Oh, there's always like the military nerds. The military nerd character in anime always fascinates. And I can kind of see why you would get into this stuff because it is totally like keeping track of Gundam model kits, but except it's just like with implements of destruction. So many things about. Oh, this one's made of Legos. That's sweet. There's so many really cool kind of military looking things. Like, what the hell is this? Oh, this is. Oh, this is Halo. Okay, I thought, is this more hammer? Humans have never made something like that. It's too cool.
Probably looks a little bit better. Show me your brave heart. Yeah, so this can looks a little bit cooler now. Than being like cone on a stick. So you now I'm not now I'm not as critical of this I think it's a little bit better now. I still think the first one's legs are better. It's just because of this though. Like giving a false impression of which way the legs turn. Yeah, boys. Let's who know. Yume okatare. Meet me and Emily for lunch tomorrow. Yume okatare. Maybe.
Depends on what your definition of lunch is, because I'm not going to be over there until 4. <sighs> At all, I'm not really sure. Rio Cotteray sucks. I guess they have that like all month long. I don't suck, it's just overrated. I don't really see the point of paying. Not if any of you guys, I don't suppose if, uh, you, the v, you the listener, has any experience with eating quality restaurant ramen. Must sound really snooty to be like picky over ramen because I know a lot of areas don't have ramen restaurants every five feet like Boston does. There used to only be like two, but now there's like seven. Oh yeah, Rimi Okadere has the best atmosphere. That's also more expensive, and they have no menu. It's just one item that you can order. I still personally prefer Pekaichi. If you're ever in the Boston area, or say PAX East or something, go to... I can give you a whole restaurant list. Pekaichi's the best. Eight dollar bowl of ramen. Very filling. It was like, and like the atmosphere is great, Japanese music, Japanese staff. The other places I've been to just have like Katy Perry in the background, and there's like, like random like Vietnamese people, like serving, making all the food, and it's just like this is not nothing wrong with that. If I go out and have like the most weeaboo food ever, totally want the authentic experience. Never really understood. There's a uh, what is it, Sapporo ramen? It's apparently an international chain, and it's in Harvard Square. But it was just really lame because like the whole place looks like a Matrix lobby. Like everything is like flat and silver and marble, and it's like this doesn't feel like a place where I should be eating ramen at all. It doesn't really feel like a restaurant. So I like, just take it. It wasn't that expensive. Ramen was pretty okay. But not as good as Pekaichi. But yes, maybe I will be having ramen tomorrow with Mepples and Emily, who is also known here as Yimel Choken. Yimel Choken from New Brunswick. Wonton ramen. It's ramen with wontons. <laughs> better be. If I actually go for this ramen, it better be like mind blown. And not just like <laughs> ramen. <laughs> With some wontons they bought from the Meiji supermarket down the street. <laughs> Don't even heard of wonton ramen. Is that something that happens in Japan? Probably. Yumi Okatare does uh, build themselves on being authentic, I guess. I'm not looking at tanks. You okay there? It's like an okay value, it's not an amazing value. Dude, like, Pikachu gives you a whole. Pikachu gives you uh, just as much ramen with sides, and all the extras are like 50 cents. So if I want extra nori, which I always do, I can get it for 50 cents. 
You get a side of rice for like a dollar. No, I think you get a side of rice for 50 cents actually. Because a dollar wouldn't really be a value. Yeah, you get a side of rice for 50 cents at Pekaichi. That's great. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's see. Mikaichi. Nerf you is a free tour. You're asking if I was alright because I was silent and heavily sighing for like five minutes without realizing. Because I guess that's valid. Well, I don't sound. But. You see, I breathe through sighing. Sighing is me. I am the sigh. I wish I had a musical keyboard for the different tones of my sighing. And I can make music with it. Let's see here. Oh yeah. I think I know what I want to do with this. I'm going to take this turbine. going to make it bigger. Draw this robot three humps without it looking cannoli or something. Not that cannoli, but bundle of hot dogs. I want it to look like I don't want it to look like a bundle of hot dogs. The biggest streamer was not a very good opening. It also wasn't very fitting with Digimon Tamers. Like all right, but I don't really like it as much as Butterfly. I don't think anybody. <clears throat> the show on Tamers was dark as hell, and nothing about it, nothing in that show had an overall arcing theme of dreams. It was really just nihilism. <laughs> well, I guess Takato had the dream of making his own Digimon at the start. But that didn't really work out well for anybody. Kind of blew up the city a bunch of times. God, what a great show. Yeah, I guess it's an hour right opening. Is there a way to make the under look more nimble? It's just so round.
Hmm. Let's see. Three messages. Email Choken. <laughs> For the side keyboard. Alright, email Choken's here. Alright, good. The light of my day. Composition could use work. Get out of here. <laughs> If you're tuning, if you're just tuning in, I'm not giving, I haven't given an explanation for what the stream is in like two hours. But, I'm redrawing some old robot art for my game Agus, which is a combining robot strategy game. The art you see on the left was drawn in 2013. That's these two goons. And they're two of the robots that I've been wanting to redraw for the longest time, but I have no... I had, like, no real reason to. So this guy came out with basically the same silhouette. So most people probably won't even notice the quality of art, but... Since he has... Since he'll have better art, better, more updated art now, I can totally... We can use, totally use him for, like, ads and stuff. And, uh... Things like that. Now if I just make Ender 100 here look compelling, which is the hardest task imaginable. Because the robot design is bad. My fault. That'd be great if I could make him look cool. I have like, I'm kind of like, I kind of have it in my head, I kind of like want it more angular. With like more open spaces, more like, not just kind of like a solid mass, but more of like a, uh, I should use, who remembers Power Rangers Lost Galaxy? Because one of my favorite Megazords of all time was in that series. And it was like the, one of the most obscure ones, because they didn't even have pilots, but it's still separated into five zords. But it was actually just like some sentient space monster that was turned into a Megazord. Um, but it was the, uh, what was it? The cent the red one was there. There was a red one and a blue one. The red one was like called the Centurion Megazord or something. But there was a blue one called the Strato something Megazord. Strato Force. It's made of like five different like blue planes and they all kind of look like E-types because they're like really like dopey drone looking things. Or I just, I'm probably going to end up erasing this entire guy so let me just not do that. I'm going to do the thing where I actually just take it and copy it. Control T. I'm going to move you down here because you are an acceptable sketch, but probably not the final product. The scorpions are just beginning. <laughs> Jesus Christ, what's happening? Oh, hey, it's Joey La Joey. Um, Stroforce Megazord? You get some shots of this? What we call Gathering Ref. And the other one's called the Centaurus. It's actually the best. Yeah, this guy was the neatest. Yeah, it was like really sleek. And like had one one of the Zords looked like Phase Ship from Cowboy Bebop. And the other one had like this sweet like dual thruster thing going and the legs mostly look the same. And then like the chest piece had this big shark fin. It was just a really cool toy. 
definitely one of my favorite toys. Maybe I want to make the thing look like the bottom one. Oh, that's like a different, that's for a different E-type entirely. None of these really. Hmm. Because I have to have it have parity with this stupid one unless I want to redraw them both. It's funny. This guy's silhouette is almost the same as the green guys underneath him. <laughs> um, this guy looks sleek though. I drew him in a rush. But I'm just putting way too much effort into it. But now I have to. Now I'm like at the point where I like want to put a lot of detail into almost every robot, and it's eventually just going to be very bad because then I'm going to have to redraw every robot. <laughs> so. The Digimon Tamers. I don't even remember this song in Digimon Tamers. I guess I only watched the dub. What was me? There was a point where I did these robots, and I just like drew like these really nice, obvious broad shapes. And actually, you know what? I think I know what I want to do with this. If any remember, if anybody remembers Obon Star Racers, which I know none of you do, I kind of had these dual side thrusters that opened up a little bit. So maybe that's what I want. That'll make it look like faster. Because if it has like more angles that go in diagonals, that makes you look faster. Known. The known thing. If I like make it look like that, it also makes it look cool. Yeah. So, anyone see La La Land? <laughs> if you haven't seen La La Land, I still recommend it. Good movie. Aside from Emily, I know Emily saw La La Land. With some jerk. Let's see here. Email choke from New Brunswick, Canada. A mystery. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Have to actually put some effort into drawing this. After I draw the thumbnail, I'm putting like 
some decent amount of detail here. I'll have to simplify it maybe. The code the Yoko. La La Land is a <laughs> La La Land is a spiritually uplifting film. Everyone left with a smile and, with a smile on their faces. What every review said that La La Land was going to be a spiritually uplifting film, and everyone's going to leave with a smile on their faces. Uh. All right, we've hit a lot of in the. We've hit a solid eleven o'clock. I keep an eye out for these guys because yeah, I'll be finishing them. I can probably kick it here. Maybe you're all done hearing my stupid voice. Let's see. Or the Digimon soundtrack, whichever one you're tired of. No one can ever be tired of the Digimon soundtrack. Zoom. Make the turbine the correct shape. All right.
I'm saying card slash? Anyway, yeah, 11.02. Keep an eye out for this. I think I've come up with an idea of the design I like. Not necessarily the pose that I'm going to use for it, but it's going to be a, it's going to be pretty cool, I think. Not as amazingly productive as some other uh, art streams, but it is also therapeutic. That's what counts. Look like this from the top. Let's see here. All right, let's do do this next week where we'll probably have a point control game. Yeah, we'll probably go back to point control next week. Uh, keep an eye out for more news from Aegis. Ah, uh, see here. I'm back. Ugh. Every time Breeze makes noises when he draws, the stream goes 10 minutes longer. That is... The movie had a Jewish bee, not believable. I'm very happy about this, where this chat has gone. Yeah, I was thinking that too. Kind of like, uh, it's, maybe this is gonna, yeah, end up more like a, um, kind of like, uh, yeah, it's like an attack helicopter. And I'll have, like, these two things on the side, but it just won't have the whirly bits. Yeah, maybe that's actually, yeah, a good, good, good eye. Yeah, it totally is kind of like an attack helicopter shape, but with, like, big turbines on the side. I'll see if I can still keep the turbines. It's also kind of like how this guy looks too. It's like, kind of has that helicopter shape where if I just went like, we totally read as a helicopter. I like the shade of blue I used for him. Okay, very good. <laughs> That looks like a badass bird, Garfunkel. All right, most excellent. All right, so I will sign off. And I wish, thank you guys for showing up. It's really good, and I like you guys a lot. Thank you for continuing to follow the robot game. Now I will go to bed. Zoom. But yeah, tune in next week for Point Control Game with uh, more new boards and um, even more exciting customized teams as we're going to be branching out from here on, not uh, just doing the inbox teams. Alright, bye bye